Hello, I'd like to introduce my colleague Stefan Elb. He's director of the Centre for Global Health Policy here at the University of Sussex. Stefan, tell us about the H5N1 virus and why it's become so controversial. Well, Jackie, the H5N1 virus is, of course, primarily a bird flu virus or an avian flu virus, uh, but it is one that does occasionally infect human beings. And in fact, since 1997, we've had more than 600 cases of human infection with H5N1, and unfortunately, 350 of those cases have proved fatal, giving this virus a mortality rate of close to 60% in the human population. So that's a big mortality, but it's a small number of people. Why is it hitting the news so recently? So you're absolutely right. It is a very small number, comparatively speaking, compared to other global health challenges. But of course, the big fear is that as the virus mutates, it may begin to spread much more easily between human beings. And if you had a virus that can spread as easily as seasonal flu, but kill 60% of people who it infects, we would have a major human, social, and economic catastrophe on our hands. So what are scientists doing to protect us against this? So scientists have been working very busily over the, over the past four years to kind of look in much greater detail at this virus to see whether it could ever evolve into a virus that would spread very easily between human beings. They've run some animal studies which have shown that with only four or five key mutations in the mm -hmm. virus, it could begin to spread much more easily between human beings, raising serious concern for, for people around and the world. And also helping with vaccine development and so on. So what has become so controversial about the reporting of the scientific research around H5N1? Well, based on the very valuable knowledge that these studies have produced, the scientists involved, of course, submitted uh, the findings of their studies to very prominent journals. Mm -hmm. And these studies include both the detailed methods of how these new viruses were produced, mm -hmm. and also which are the key mutations that make this virus spread much more easily. The concern amongst the security community is that this knowledge could potentially also be put to much more dangerous use if it got into the hands of, say, bioterrorists or other dangerous political groups. And mm -hmm. they are very concerned about making this kind of data public. So why not just ban it? The, in the United States, there is actually an advisory board called the National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity, which is made up of scientific experts, which for the first time in its history actually recommended that these studies not mm -hmm. be published. Mm -hmm. They didn't formally ban it, mm -hmm. but they asked that key bits of the studies not be published. Things like the particular mutations involved and the recipe of how you create these viruses. Mm -hmm. This was an unprecedented move by the security community and it created a huge uproar in the scientific community. And what happened? In the end, there was a huge international debate involving many different national and international organizations. In the end, it looks like the scientific community had the stronger arguments and that they won out on this occasion because in the end, both studies have been published, but only oh. after very intense discussions and negotiations. And there is still a feeling, particularly in the secur security community, mm -hmm. that the underlying issues have actually not been properly resolved. So there are always new organisms. Over the last 30 years, we've seen HIV, SARS, H5N1. This won't be the last. What's going to happen next time? You're absolutely right. This will most certainly not be uh, the last dangerous virus to come along. What we are hoping is that we can use this controversy over the next couple of years to build a much better international system of governing these kinds of issues, mm -hmm. dual use research issues, which are research issues where we have legitimate scientific basis mm -hmm. for doing the research, but where there is also a dangerous side to it. But we must have an international collaboration to get this done. We are a little bit concerned at the moment that particular countries are trying to go it on their own, putting in their own domestic frameworks for regulating these issues. And why does that matter? It matters because uh, unless we have an international framework, we will have a whole patchwork of different regulatory environments in different countries. A lot of scientific cooperation is now international, and unless there's an international cooperation, any kind of regulation can just be outmaneuvered by doing it in a different country or in a different place where there are different regulations. So really this will only work if we work collectively as a kind of global community. Thank you very much, Stefan. Pleasure.